So I think we're probably good to get started. Um, gang, thanks very much, everybody who's joined the webinar here today. Um, just a quick housekeeping. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, enter them into the chat um, and Carly will uh, bring them to our attention. Um, if there are um, questions that we can answer on the fly, we'll certainly do so. Otherwise, we'll answer them at the end. Um, but please feel free to ask any questions that you may have. We're happy to answer. So thanks to everybody for joining, joining the webinar. We really appreciate it. And we're looking forward to chatting about this. Um, today, we're going to talk about strategies for effective remote compliance training. And specifically, we're going to talk about um, using a game-based approach to drive um, more engagement and better learning outcomes. Um, so um, without further ado, we'll jump right in. Um, so first I wanna talk about the state of remote learning um, in the UK. Um, so prior to the pandemic, only 5% of the UK workforce force actually worked remotely. Um, but by April, 2020, um, it was almost 50%. So um, as we all know, because most of us are working at home, um, the pandemic has forced companies to accelerate any work from home programs that they had and, and change the way they do things um, and allow folks to work remotely. And um, while um, it seems as though this may be just a pandemic um, uh, phenomenon, 71% um, of UK leaders say that some remote working will continue even post pandemic and 33% of leaders are considering a permanent move to remote, to remote working. Um, so I think um, remote working is here for um, the, sh the medium term and potentially a lot more in the long term. So it's going to force a lot of changes um, on uh, management and organizations as they figure out how to um, try to work um, remotely and have their staff work remotely and, and still be effective. And I think one of the bigger challenges is how do we deliver training? And specifically, how do we deliver compliance training? So I think compliance training has some um, inherent challenges that existed even for in-person training or the typical traditional ways that we train, driving participation um, being one of them. And I think that's amplified um, when you're talking about a remote, remote workers. Um, so I think we're going to need to find ways to make compliance training enticing so that we can drive that initial participation. Um, one of the challenges we got to overcome in, in making training, uh, compliance training com um, uh, compelling is overcoming apathy. Um, when we talk to uh, our financial institution employees, um, they don't list compliance training as one of their favorite things to do in a given day. Um, and there's, a, there's often a bit of a resistance. And I think part of that is how compliance training is delivered. And then the other part is that um, the content itself isn't the most compelling. And then the last piece is for a lot of employees, it's, it's you know, when compared to other training that can help them advance in their careers and so forth, compliance training is really more about um, helping the organization. There's not as much what's in it for me. So I think we got to find ways to overcome that apathy. Um, then there's competing with distractions. Um, workers at home have a different set of distractions than you would at the office. Everything from kids to uh, pets to Netflix and your fridge. Um, the, the, there's a lot of um, uh, compelling distractions that might, people might choose over taking their compliance training. So I think we need to f um, find ways to overcome that and to, and to be as compelling as some of the distractions that exist at home. And then the last piece is, how do we make compliance training stick um, so that you know, when we're delivering uh, remote training, um, there's gotta be ways to, to make it um, sufficiently engaging and drive a bit of repetition so that that training sticks. And so um, I think those are the big challenges that we're gonna be forced to, to grapple with um, as we deal with a remote workforce. Um, so this is where I believe a game-based approach can be really effective. Um, and I want to talk a little bit now about some of the advantages of that game-based approach. I mean, the first thing is that game-based training is a little bit more magnetic. Um, when you position the activity as a game and issue a challenge, 
um, people are much more willing to participate. And we found this in lots of different genres of training, not just compliance training, um, but by, is by issuing a challenge and by positioning it as play now, as opposed to take training, um, it becomes a little bit more compelling and you're able to drive that initial participation. Once you've got them in, um, now, it's, now the challenge is making sure that the content um, is a little bit more engaging and interactive. And so I think game-based learning allows us to do that by doing a couple things, turning the actual experience into a game, but also um, breaking it into chunks for daily micro-learning. So rather than having um, employees take um, long form training that can take, you know, an hour or a couple hours in a day, we can break it into daily micro learning. And, and, you know, if you think about how people learn, um, if you continually repeat an action each day, um, you're much more likely to retain that than you are when you try to cram everything in, kind of like you might have for your exams, your tests when you were in school. Um, you know, studying hard the night before, going and regurgitating all the information and promptly forgetting it thereafter. Um, but if you do something every day, much the way a musician would do or an athlete, um, you tend to onboard that. And I think gamification or game-based learning, I should say, allows you to chunk that into daily micro-learning. The other thing is, um, through a game-based approach, you get instant feedback. Um, and so even when you make mistakes, you get feedback that lets you know it's a mistake, but also guides you towards the correct answer or gives you hints about the correct answer. And it's through mistakes that we learn very effectively. It's a great quote um, from um, guy Ralph Nader that says, your, your greatest teacher is your last mistake. And I think most of us don't do things perfectly the first time. Um, and we mess them up a couple of times, but it's through those mistakes that we learn and we adapt um, and get better at things. And I think the game-based approach really is great at that because it provides immediate feedback and doesn't necessarily, it uses the mistake to, to, to further educate. Um, next thing is you get really in-depth tracking, which I think is really helpful in understanding um, where your weaknesses are, where your strengths are, identifying um, your superstars and your slackers who aren't participating um, and making sure that you're increasing um, your compliance posture, as it were, by looking at the tracking and making sure that it's resonating. You can also identify specifically which cor courses are doing well, um, and you can, so you can look at it from a learner level, but also from a content level. So I think in-depth traffic tracking is a really big advantage of the game-based approach. And the last thing is, um, you know, we tend to see better out out learning outcomes um, and driving them a little bit faster because of the daily micro learning and the sort of distributed practice that that drives. Um, we see that retention is a little bit higher um, and we get to those retention levels a little bit faster than we do when we make it sort of um, periodic large chunk learning. So I think those are some of the big advantages of a game based approach. Now I want to define um, just quickly the difference between gamification and game based learning. Um, because gamification is a, is a very popular word uh, these days, and, and it's a little bit of fool's gold in my opinion. Um, so gamification is where you take your existing content. So let's say you were delivering compliance training by asking people to read PDFs and check out PowerPoint um, presentations. So you would then say, for every PDF you, you, you read, we'll give you a badge or we'll give you a point. Um, and then people... Uh, accumulate these badges or points and move up a leaderboard. So you've tacked some game elements on badges, points, leaderboards, um, but the content itself hasn't changed at all. Um, and so the gamification will have an ephemeral effect because the badges and points and leaderboards quickly have very little meaning and the experience is still the same and it's still not interactive or compelling. And so gamification looks good over the short term but its effects are very short term. Where game-based learning actually morphs the training itself, the experience into a game to make it more engaging. And so rather than saying read a PDF or look at a PowerPoint, it's play a game and learn through making those mistakes. And as you um, correct your mistakes and improve at the game, 
then all those gamification elements like leaderboards, points, and so forth come into play, but they have context because the experience is a game. So that's the clear definition or difference between gamification and game-based learning. It's an important one um, because um, their efficacy is very different. So I'm gonna hand it over to Robert now, who's gonna walk you through some of the content that um, um, RB Compliance has, has created in um, the Lemonade environment um, so that you can see it in action. And I shall just share my screen so you, everybody can see what this training system looks like. So yes, quick introduction just before, just before I uh, showcase the, the compliance training that, that we've created in Lemonade's, uh, Lemonade's platform, so to speak. So um, my name is Robert Bell and um, my background's in law and, and in compliance for financial services firms. And then since 2012, uh, I, I set up and, and run um, a consultancy, a compliance consultancy company, RB Compliance. Uh, we do all the typical stuff that you would get from, an, uh, from, from a compliance consultancy uh, that you would expect, you know, auditing, a lot of third line of defense for medium to smaller um, financial services firms, a lot of advice, FCA applications, that sort of thing. But also what we've actually found out that is that 60, 70% of our work has turned out to be to be training or learning and development, whatever you like to call it, which I think is great. I think it's a much nicer day uh, to do a day, uh, meeting new people, sharing experiences and, and sharing what I've learned over the years uh, with, 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 with new people. And basically, essentially, our goal in life almost, I think that's maybe the, the best phrase, is to make compliance training as fun as it possibly can be. And that's always been the, the case with our face-to-face -face training. You know what it's like, everyone's got their compliance day-to-day, -day, um, compliance training session and their heart sinks and you can see the lack of energy. And, and our goal and my particular goal is that they come out at the end of our session and think, do you know what, that was out of all the training I've done, that was the best session, that was the most fun, the most entertainment. And it does help drive uh, learning outcomes and it, it helps them retain the information if they've enjoyed it as well. So that's always been our goal at RB Compliance, to have that kind of fun, engaging element to compliance training. And then uh, I became aware of, of this fantastic system developed by Lemonade uh, LXP, and, and that's where we've managed to partner together to, to essentially plug in the compliance courses that we have into this system to make the complete package. And, and, and as John mentioned, the, the real advantages are, are the actual learning retention, the, the fact that you aren't learning in, in big sessions, you're learning in little chunks. So it's actually very practical is what we find. We found with some uh, clients, it's, it's best for them, uh, for their frontline agents to have this open in the background and then between calls, time when they wouldn't be doing anything, they can pop in, do one of the tasks, do one of this what we call steps, and then oh, get a call and jump back on. So it's very much engaged with their with their uh, with their day to day role. For other firms or people in different roles, we'll find that they they might use it as a as an energizer. So ten minutes a day, five minutes a day, pop in the system, a bit of an energizer activity works really really well. Um, and we've found people like to do it on their way to and from work as well. Uh, it works really well on mobile devices, so that's absolutely absolutely doable too. The key is that people want to come back and they want to keep playing it because they want to win. Yeah, they're engaged with the game and they want to, they want to uh, be as successful as they possibly can. And there's a, there's a few ways that, that that occurs, mainly because of the quality of the game itself, which we'll show you in just a minute, but also it can be driven by firms as well. And, and things like we have a, there's a leaderboard, um, so you can see who's who's progressed furthest in the game, and and that could be maybe fed into incentives, into uh, their appraisals, maybe as an objective in their, their annual appraisal, for example, to be as high up the, the leaderboard as they can. That's that obviously encourages participation, or it can be uh, an ob you know as I mentioned an objective that you have to. Um, completes a certain number of courses per year, and there's 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 that you know element to it as well. 
um, and that all helps to drive to drive engagement with this system too. And all the analytics, analytics which John will come back at the end and show you, um, supports all the information that you would need to be able to, to deliver it in that way. So let's have a look at the system itself and what you have on your screen now is essentially what the what the, the game player would see when they've logged in. And the idea of the game is that you start with a really basic bank, we have picked a very typical financial services institution, uh, you know, something that everyone gets their head around, knows how it works, so that's why we picked a bank. Um, a very, very small, very rural, old fashioned type of bank. And the idea is that um, by, uh, by uh, essentially buying additions to whether it's your headquarters, your mobile apps, your internet, um, buying new branches or, or redeveloping the branches that you have, adding a phone channel, adding cash points, you're buying more into, into your bank, therefore it's developing and right at the end of the game on, on, on the higher levels, you would end up with a, you know, a very modern type of organization and it's sitting in a metropolis and and that's, that's the aim that you've got to try and get to. So how do users get to that point? Well, as mentioned, they pop into, into one of these six boxes and they purchase, um, they purchase additional uh, things that are useful for the bank. So from a very simple level, very cheap, there's some just physical signage, right the way through to digital signage, mobile wickets, they can add, um, computer systems in branch, email text toolkits, and actually in itself, this is, is part of the learning because these are all genuine additions and genuine pieces of technology that financial services firms will all use to try and engage with their customers and improve their performance. So actually by picking the little changes and, and picking the additions to, to, to the business, that in itself is the, the users getting an idea of how financial services firms would work. The one we looked in there was just changes to branches, equally changes to form channels, have very different items that the users can purchase. They purchase it with money, of course. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's what's needed and money in this world we call points. And how do you get money? You can see at the top of the screen there. Well, the more points you have is because you have clients and the more clients you have, um, they deposit more money with your bank and, and thus you have, you have more, more money to be able to spend on upgrades, etc. So the key to this game is to get as many clients through the door as you possibly can so that they deposit their money just like it is with all of our firms. Well, how do, the, how do the game players do that? Well, they click play now. And this is where we have a, a suite of 30 um, compliance modules. All the typical stuff you would expect to see. And um, we'd like to start with an introduction to, F, to the FCA. So it's really basic, but introducing the FCA, what they do, consequences for not following their rules, their approach to regulation. You've got GDPR, in data protection, and you've got to split that into a few different modules. So, data retention and deletion is one. We've got a different one focusing on principles and rights. For consumer credit firms, we've got consumer credit rules there in the top right corner. As you look, there's an overview, so CONC in the FCA handbook, uh, and, and vulnerable customers, and so on and so forth. This one you can see is our off the shelf version. So essentially, if you decided to go with the platform, there's two, there's two approaches you can take. You can, you can go straight in and say, yeah, use the content you, you, got, you, you guys have already developed. That's, that's fine for us. So we're gonna teach them all about compliance, vulnerable customers, uh, there's soft skills training around dealing with difficult situations, financial difficulties, information security, money laundering, financial crime, all the usual stuff. That's great, we'll go with that. Fine. Or um, you can develop it with us as well. We're, ha we're happy, happy to do that. So we can, we can look at what's there and do a bit of a mapping exercise, see what we'd use from what we've got, tweak it in certain areas where you want maybe want firm specific examples put in, or we can create extra modules for you. So if you're an insurance firm, we can have one on ICOMPS. Yeah? If you're a mortgage 
backbone, M pulse, etc. Yeah. But we've got all the typical stuff. One thing I will point out is the content rules training. So FCA PRA regulated firms need to make sure that staff undertake content rules training and this meets the needs and the requirements in SMCR to, to, to do the content rules training. So um, in terms of training staff and you have the record within the system itself, so you've you got that recorded and it meets the requirements around the content rules training as well. But what I will show you and focus on today is what we call a mix-up, which is a bit of a showcase example of, of, of one of the courses, of, of a mix of the courses, yeah, just, just to be used today. So the, the, the game player decides, right, today is, is GDPR day, uh, or the manager decides that it's GDPR day, or, or whatever subject it might be. They go in, in this case, we're doing mix-up, and they are, uh, they are given a number of steps. We can decide that they have to complete these in order or we can leave it open for them. Depends on, on the training and, and whether it's something that needs to be completed in order or not as to whether, whether we do that. The steps are essentially mini games and they're all very different and that's denoted by the, uh, the colorful, colorful shape you can see on the screen. So uh, the role of the FCA is done by streak, which is a type of, type of game that we have. And um, then we have what is vulnerability, which is true or false. Vulnerability of practice, which is a really good one. It's a, it's a, a scenario. So it's people talking and you have to decide which reply to go with. So it's bringing it into, into a real practice. So really good for frontline agents. And then we've got multiple choice. Um, and there's one at the bottom uh, is uh, polygraph, which is a really interesting uh, a, a useful one, which is essentially, say you have a, a policy you want them to read, how do you know everyone's read the policy? Well, it, it has the, the piece of information or the policy that they need to read, but some words are changed and they have to identify the words that are changed. So just make sure that they've read it and it engages them in the reading. So let's take a look at a couple of these. Let's take a look at what they look like. So they simply click play, there we go. So yeah, so it comes up, it says that in this case, we're gonna learn about the FCA and some basic steps. So this is one of the one of the early steps we have in the course. And this is a streak. So the idea is they get as many answers in a row as possible, and that gives them more points. And there's uh, you know, eight questions. So the C and FCA stands for conduct. And as I said, this is really basic um, information to introduce them. And Whenever they get one right or wrong, at the bottom there's a bit of extra information comes up. And as John was saying before, that's the, you know, if they get it wrong, it's a hint for the right answer, so they learn from their mistakes. If they get it right, we'll try and give a little bit more information. So when they're reading it, they're retaining a bit more. So which of the following do you think the FCA would like to see from your firm? Don't think it's high sales bonuses. Um, probably monitors the staff performance, so we'll go with that. That's right. And the more they get, the more points they get. So we know that the FCA is a conduct regulator. If we get one wrong though, you'll see what happens uh, in the top right corner. It says, um, at the bottom it says not quite right. And in the top right corner, they lose a heart, which is a life. So they can get a total of five wrong in this go. And then they're back down to the bottom of the street. And essentially the more points they get and the higher they get on the street by the eighth question, the, uh, the more clients they win, that then automatically gets put back into their bank and then they use that, uh, you know, the clients are, are added and, and they bring their money and they can use that to buy more features for their organization. So yeah, nice and simple, but really interactive, gets them playing, gets them thinking about answers and throws information at the learner in a, in a very in a very different way to usual. So this game, a little bit of the streak is the simple kind of true and false game, good old classic. Um, so are all people with mental health conditions vulnerable? I wouldn't say they all are. There we go. A person with learning difficulties could be vulnerable, could be, so we'll see, yeah. So it teaches them a bit of the basics about vulnerability. And in the vulnerability course, this is one of the first steps they would have to create.
So you get the you get the idea. Fantastic. So we'll come out of that, and then they might go through uh, true and false uh, for vulnerability. They might go through other similar ones to learn the Texas model, to learn the idea protocol, um, to learn soft skills around helping vulnerable customers, and then come into the scenario. Is the one to put the, what they've learned into practice. So you get a scenario, and it is a customer talking to us. And to begin with, we just to get them in the conversation, we just give them one option for the reply. Just to always the start of the conversation. It's kind of drawing in good habits and getting people in good habits around data protection. But then they have different choices to make. And um, depending on the answer they give, uh, you can see they've got a time bar at the bottom. So I have to talk quick now. <laughs> they've got a time bar at the bottom in which to answer. Um, depending on the quality of the answer, it'll take them through different paths down the conversation. Okay. So it's quite a good conversation that you practice it and see how see how the conversation goes. And in some of the situations, if they answer it badly, the conversation goes really, really badly and they'll the learn from that. Other times they can try and rescue it as, as, um, as they go through. But in all the time it's then practice, actually I've got to say, follow Texas, I've got to thank the customer, I've got to explain how I'll use the data, get explicit consent, um, ask what they can do to help and find the right solutions. So yeah, I'll just show you the last couple, nice and quickly, because um, I think you're probably getting the idea by now um, of the type and range of different activities that we've got built in the system. It's working more at its normal speed now, so it must be my internet connection for a little bit. Um, so yeah, this is this is you know, kind of true, so you've got to say which one is true. And so again, it's making them really read the data and, uh, and take that on board. And then if you think, yeah, actually, yeah, I can use more than just consent to process special category data, then they would pick, then they would pick that as the correct answer which of course is true under Article 9. Fantastic. So yeah, so these are these are the games and there's a real nice range of them. I will show you the polygraph nice and quickly so that you get the sense of, uh, of of, of how it works. So this is really useful if you've got a, a chunk of text that you want people to read and actually want them to read it, uh, such as a policy document or, or maybe a shortened version of it. So in this case, we've got the text, and and you've got to uh, you've got to actually find the data that you think is wrong and pick the correct answer. Yeah, I don't think it's personal effects. You actually got to pick the right answers. We can give them the option of having two uh, things to choose from, or sometimes just actually picking the word that's wrong and, and throwing in the word you know, that that's right instead is the is the main thing to do. I don't think best friend is right. Just call one at the corner of my eye, or another natural person is right, and then they can submit that. That got to three out of seven. But really make sure that they're engaged uh, with the content that you want them want them to read, which is absolutely fantastic. And then, yeah, once they've, they've played the game, you can see how quickly they do them. You know, they take anything between two and six minutes per, per step, per game. When they've done it, it'll come back, and whatever clients they've won, of course, if they do badly, they can lose clients as well, so that's not so good. They really want to <laughs> improve. They come back, there's hopefully more clients, and they can then wait for their points to build up, wait for them to deposit more money, and then go and and purchase additions to the HQ, etc., and ultimately move up the leaderboard that they might have uh, at work. That can be departmental. It can be in your work, and see if they can get to the the top spot. So that's that's a showcase of, of the compliance content that we've plugged into this fantastic system. I'm going to hand you back to John to go through some of the analytics because. Yep, it's absolutely fantastic. It's great having the uh, it's great having the, 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 the game side and the learning side, but of course your organization needs to know how everyone is progressing. So John is going to take you through that side of things. 
Actually, before you jump into the analytics too much, John, I, we got a really good question in the Q&A. Okay. Um, the question is, can the game-based approach be effective for an older workforce? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So the common perception is a game-based approach is really more targeted to a younger workforce. But what we've seen at the numerous financial institutions that we've rolled out um, Lemonade for, um, there doesn't seem to be any preference um, um, with regard to uh, demographics. We see um, lots of engagement from older staff and uh, as well as younger staff. And so um, while the perception is that it's young kids who play games, um, it's uh, everybody actually plays them. If you think about, you know, board games, um, everybody plays those and actually casual games, the most, uh, the most, um, uh, the busiest users or the most frequent users of casual games are actually women in their forties and fifties. So it depends on the type of game, but um, where training is concerned, um, we haven't seen um, any drop off when it comes to an older audience. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to share out my screen here. And so you should all be able to see my tracking screen here. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through some of the analytics um, that you can get in the Lemonade platform. Um, this first screen shows you um, basically engagement. So learner moments are challenges and individual questions that learners answer in a day. Visits per day is the amount of times people are coming and visiting um, and participating in training in a given day. Um, activity heat map shows you when the um, training is most uh, heavily trafficked and used. And this is really useful for you to understand what times of day you might want to promote your training program to drive um, the most engagement. Typically, these training programs will be pr promoted by email. Sometimes you could promote them in Slack and so forth. Um, but basically, figuring out exactly the best time of day to send out that message where the users or learners are more likely to engage. Um, we can also look at engagement metrics like total steps played and minutes played um, on a given day. So you get good engagement metrics to understand how much people are engaged and when they're most frequently engaged. When we get into efficacy, this starts to get interesting. Um, um, at the beginning of your training program, what you'll see in this graph is most people will be in the not started category. And there's a bunch of categories. There's not started, novice, intermediate, advanced, and expert. So at the beginning of your training program, as I mentioned, the bar will be mostly gray, but as your program matures, it'll turn increasingly green um, and that green metric means that um, your, your learners have reached an expert level, which means that your compliance training has been effective and also that the program's getting mature and it might be time to um, implement more content or expand the breadth of your, of your compliance training. Um, Lemonade also takes baseline scores. Um, so the first couple of times a learner will play a given module, it records that score as a baseline. And then as they master that content, it actually takes their average score. So then we can pit their average score against their baseline to measure improvement. And this is particularly interesting because um, the, the way that the booster game that Robert explained where you're trying to level up your bank, the way that that works is the better you do in each training module, the more points you earn, the more customers you earn, um, which earn you points while you're at rest. So um, it encourages learners to participate or take the training programs more than once to get the best possible score. And so what you see is learners will repeat certain modules um, to improve their scores to, to progress faster in the booster game. So what you see is that distributed practice actually improves learning outcomes and Lemonade can measure it by pitting their average against their baseline scores. Okay. So that's kind of looking at the general dashboard. We can also dig into each learner um, on the platform. And so we can go and dig in and see how each person is doing. So let's pick James here. So here's James, his baseline knowledge was a 75. Uh, he's now at 87. He falls in the 82nd percentile uh, of all learners or 83rd, I suppose. And then we can go and look and see what groups he's part of and how he ranks in each group, because you can group 
various people at your organization. You may have some staff that need some compliance training and other staff that need different compliance training. So you can actually create groups in Lemonade. Um, then you can also go and see specifically what courses James has taken, what his scores are. So you can see where James is accelerating, um, excelling, I mean, and where he's lagging behind and some content that he hasn't actually taken yet. I can also go and look at the specific activity, which will look into um, each course and see um, his grades um, and when he started and so on and so forth. So I can get really rich information on each learner and how they're progressing in the compliance training. I can also go and look at my courses and see how my courses are performing. This is kind of a unique um, bit of reporting. So let's go to um, focus on fraud here. So you can see the various steps that are made up uh, and, and that make up this course. And you can see um, when they were updated, when they were created, how many times they've been started, how many times they've been finished, um, and time spent learning. And then you can see how many questions have been answered um, and what their average scores are and their baseline scores. And then so this number, this uptick here shows the, the improvement of the average score against the baseline score. So you can measure actual improvement. I can also go and dig right into the individual step. And this is really Im important reporting because I can see specifically what questions learners are getting right and which ones they're getting wrong. So here I can see um, the term um, that people, 100% of people are understanding the term of fraud, but external fraud, understanding that external fraud doesn't impact the bank, only 50% of people realize that. So I can identify individual knowledge gaps in the organization um, where compliance training is, is, is concerned. So I can see where some of my vulnerabilities are by looking at my content tracking. So that is um, a very quick look at the tracking platform, the tracking suite within Lemonade LXP. Um, you can obviously see um, starts and finishes and grades and so on and so forth, but it gives you a much deeper look into um, the performance of your program. So the last thing I want to uh, highlight here is sort of the results that we see um, from Lemonade training. So first of all, 84% voluntary participation rate, and that ties back to the advantages of game-based learning. Um, by making it a game and making it fun, you'll see a much higher participation rate, and that's a voluntary participation rate as opposed to sort of a mandatory one. So it really speaks to the efficacy of game-based learning where driving initial engagement and participation is concerned. Um, the typical knowledge increase we see is about 25%. Um, so we're seeing really um, exceptional learning outcomes. And then when we poll employees, we find that 92% of employees prefer Lemonade training to other training, and 88% would like to see more training in Lemonade because they're enjoying the experience. So I think um, it goes a long way to driving participation and continued participation and, and distributed practice when the learners are actually enjoying it. And I think it also speaks to um, a bit of empathy from the organization recognizing that employees aren't loving compliance training but the organization is willing to take a step to make that a little more interesting and a little more compelling which will then make employees much more willing to participate so those are the, the numbers that we get and then i think that pretty much covers off our webinar for today i just wanted to put robert's information up here um, in case you have questions or would like um, a personal demo or would like to engage him, um, here is his contact information. Um, so thank you very much to everybody for joining the webinar. We really appreciate it. Robert, is there anything you wanted to say in closing? Yeah, just thank you as well. And please contact me if you want any more details about how it works, how we can how we can enroll and set it all up. Or, or as you say, if you want a personal demo, yeah, please give me, give me a contact and, and we'll go from there. Okay, thank you very much, gang. Are there any other questions, Carly? Yeah, we do have one more here that I guess we can uh, sign off with. Um, how quickly can we get up and running on this platform? But yeah, great question. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, for example, if it's the, the off the shelf version, then, then we can do it this week. <laughs> we can get you going and uh, yeah, as soon as everything's signed and sealed, um, it's really, really easy to upload your learners. So that's, that's no problem. 
if it develops means developing the content it just depends how much how much you need developed you know if it's uh, how big the job is um so we can we can we can get a feel for, for how much they would need and and uh and go from there i think that covers it okay great thank you very much gang have a great day